right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to another STL Zoom webinar. My name is Allison, and I am an educator at the St. Louis Zoo. And I am so delighted that you are taking time out of your morning to spend it with me learning about monarch butterflies. Uh, today's webinar is all about milkweed for monarchs. Now, a few things before we get started. Uh, Connor, if you could pull up our community guidelines for me. Thank you very much. All right, so our community learning standards. I just wanna go over these before we start today. Um, as a reminder, if you have not located the chat box already, go ahead and open that. Um, but please, while you are in there, do be friendly and respectful of others in your interactions in the chat box. Uh, please use the Q&A box, which will be located right next to the chat box, for relevant and appropriate questions regarding today's webinar. Um, you may use the chat box to respond and interact with each other in regards today's, to today's webinar. Uh, but do be mindful of the fact that I do have Connor behind the scenes moderating, and if our behavior um, maybe isn't so respectful in the chat box, he'll probably pop in to remind you of that. And then if it continues, you may be removed from the webinar. So that hasn't had to happen, and we like to keep it that way. Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and go to our next slide here. So once again, before we get started, I see a lot of you have found the chat box already. If you haven't, while you're in there, go ahead and set to respond to all panelists and attendees, and let me know where you're zooming in from and how many people are watching with you today. We love to see where all our attendees are from. Um, if you find the Q&A box, please submit your questions there. If you put them in the chat, there's a good chance they might get missed. So like I said, we do have a tech person behind the scenes. His name is Connor. He might be throwing a few things in the chat for you to look at. Um, and then at the very end, we will have an enjoyment poll. We do enjoy doing these webinars for all of you, and we'd like to know what you think about them as well. So all right, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so like I said, today's topic is all about monarch butterflies. And monarch butterflies are a species of butterfly that is native to the continent of North America. So, oh my gosh, hi everybody. So I see somebody from Melville, St. Louis, Saudi Arabia, hello, welcome. Baldwin, excellent. All right, hi, Gall family. All right, we're so excited that everybody's here today. Uh, so I'm going to start sharing a PowerPoint for you all to see because sometimes pictures can uh, help us out than more than just me talking. <laughs> all right, so here we go. All right, so milkweed for monarchs. Hopefully you guys can all see that really, really well. And I'm gonna do just a little bit of stuff for me. You can't see what I'm doing, but I need to make sure I can still see the chat. So before we get started, I'm gonna have Connor share a poll with you because I'm curious, does anyone in attendance today have milkweed in their yard? So simple yes or no. Do you have milkweed in your space? Maybe you have a balcony, maybe you have a courtyard, maybe you have a big backyard, a small backyard. Hmm. How many of us have milkweed? And if you don't, that's okay. <laughs> Just wanna get an idea of what I am working with here. Oh yeah, planted seeds, nothing just yet. Yeah, I'm kind of in some of that too. Sometimes it takes a little bit to, for that milkweed to come up. And I've learned some things along the way from going milkweed too. So, all right. We'll do just another few seconds and then I think we'll go ahead and end that poll. Because it looks like a majority of us do not have milkweed in our space. And like I said, that is perfectly fine. I just wanted to know how many of you were experienced. So, all right, so milkweed for monarchs. So first and foremost, why does the zoo care about monarch butterflies? Well, if you are not familiar with it, we do have a Center for Native Pollinator Conservation, and this is one of our 17 wild care centers. Uh, now, our wild care centers are dedicated um, to wildlife management and recovery, conservation science, and support of the human populations 
wherever these centers uh, are located. And they are located all over the world. But we do have three of them right in St. Louis's backyard in our home state of Missouri. And one of them is our Center for Native Pollinator Conservation. And this center really wants to help um, everyone appreciate and get to know your local native friendly pollinators like bees and butterflies. And the center has also worked really hard to partner with a lot of City of St. Louis agencies to help bridge the gap maybe between our local population and urban wildlife. And one way that we can do that is with the City of St. Louis, their Milkweed for Monarch initiative. So, Monarch butterflies, like I said, are an iconic species of North America. They're really beautiful, and there are some really simple ways that we can help them. But let's get to know a little bit about monarch butterflies first. So like all butterflies, monarchs go through a special life cycle called metamorphosis. But for the monarch butterfly, this starts with milkweed. Uh, now, moths and caterpillars, their larvae, they need a host plant. So something where they can eat and grow and eat and grow and eat and grow, kind of like the very hungry caterpillar. But in the monarch's case, the only plant that it eats so it can grow is milkweed. So that's, that's the only thing it eats. And milkweed is really special in that it has some toxins in its leaves and its plant tissues that the caterpillar will accumulate. So if we want a really cool science word for the day, we can call that bioaccumulation. Whoa, <laughs> you don't have to remember that. Uh, but that essentially makes the monarch caterpillar taste bad so that maybe something will spit it out if it tries to eat it. So once you have a stand of milkweed, and this is some common milkweed that was growing in my backyard a few years ago, hopefully you have a lady monarch come by and lay an egg. And I've drawn an arrow to point to that egg because those eggs are super tiny. They're maybe about the size of the tip of a pencil or a pen, so really, really little. And a female monarch, will come along, lay about one egg. Occasionally it's more than one egg, but usually one egg on the bottom of a monarch leaf. And they can lay more than one egg on an entire plant, but it's usually just one egg per leaf. All right, so now after about three to five days, that egg will hatch into a larva or a caterpillar. And this larva, this caterpillar, like I said, its job is to eat and to grow, and to eat and to grow, and to eat and to grow. And scientists, we call each of those stages, so it grows so big and then it's kind of gets a little tight in its little exoskeleton and it needs to shed it. We call those instars. And they go through about five instars, so five times that they eat shed, eat and shed, eat and shed and grow. And the little caterpillars will usually eat that exoskeleton after they shed it as a way to recuperate some lost nutrients, right? We don't do that, we're not caterpillars. But eventually after about 11 to 18 days of eating and growing and eating and growing, they get to be like this fat little guy right here. So that's a nice plump juicy little caterpillar. It's ready to go to its next stage. So I think they're so cute when they look like that. And I did see someone in the chat said some monarch butterflies are poisonous. Yeah, that's absolutely right because they eat that milkweed and that's what makes them poisonous. Now go ahead and type in the chat for me. What color are these little monarch caterpillars? What colors are they? And maybe even we can take our thinking a step further what could those colors tell us about that little caterpillar? Maybe you're a hungry bird. And you're looking at that big fat caterpillar that's hanging on that leaf. Oh man, yeah, so yellow and black are kind of its main colors. Yeah, kind of yellow and black, those are really, really bright colors. So if you're a hungry bird, what might those colors tell you? Go ahead and let me know in the chat. Hmm. 
I am a hungry bird looking at that squishy yellow, black and white caterpillar. Oh man, yes, I'm seeing it pop up. Stay away. I'm poisonous. Don't eat me. I taste really, really yucky. <laughs> so those are warning colors. So after that 11 to 18 days, that caterpillar will turn into a pupa or a chrysalis is what we might call a butterfly pupa, a chrysalis, <laughs> right? I love that, don't eat my guts. That's right, Quincy. <laughs> so these little caterpillars will find a safe place in a garden. Um, in the picture, mine, this caterpillar, decided a nice safe place was in between lots of leaves of a group of asters that I had growing and they'll make a little silk pad. So caterpillars can make silk, but they don't make silk like spiders make silk. So they make their little silk pad, they attach their little bottom to that silk pad, they hang upside down, they make a J shape, the monarch caterpillars do, and then when they're all ready, they will shed their caterpillar exoskeleton one last time, and then what we have left is a chrysalis. Um, there are some videos online of this process happening. It's fascinating. I've watched it online and in person so many times, and it blows my mind every time. It's an amazing, incredible process to witness. So now they will stay in that pupa, in that chrysalis, between 8 and 14 days. And after that 8 to 14 days, what emerges is a beautiful monarch butterfly. Now, the monarch that I have pictured is a male monarch butterfly. That's right, I said it's a male monarch butterfly. When you're looking at monarchs, you can actually tell by looking at them if they are male or female, if they are a boy or a girl. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment because I have something to show you that will help us figure out how we can tell the difference between a male and a female monarch butterfly. So I have a few items with me from the zoo's biofact collection. And we're really fortunate to have this collection. Um, sometimes they are preserved, our animal pieces, and that's after the animal passes away from natural causes. So I have a couple of butterfly mounts, is what we call them, to show you. So now this is, we'll start with this one a female monarch butterfly. So hopefully you're not getting too much glare from my screen. Maybe I'll hold it back a little bit. Let me know if you're having trouble seeing that. I'll adjust the angle of which I am holding. So this is a female monarch butterfly. So the places where we will be looking will be the hind wings. So that's these bottom two wings right here. We have four wings and high hind wings. Right. And then butterflies, they're insects, so they have a head, a thorax, an abdomen, six legs, two antennae, and then they also have wings. Right. So we're taking a look at the hind wings. Now in our female, we can see these black lines, we call them veins, and that's pretty much it. So we have our orange and our black warning color, um, so also warning things like hungry birds that I taste bad stay away. <laughs> um, but what we're going to look for are two black dots in this region if we're looking for a male monarch butterfly. So let's look at a male and see how we can tell the difference. I wanna make sure I'm holding this the correct way so you can see the dots, there we go. So we're looking at these two dots right here. Okay. And those are for releasing pheromones so that's another really big science word. And pheromones are just something a lot of animals use. It's a, a scent. We can't smell it as humans, but butterfly antennas are specially adapted to pick up on those pheromones that the males are releasing. And this is how the males and females find each other. Because as we'll found, find out, butterflies, these kinds especially, travel a really long way. And it can be kind of hard to find one another. So if you are observing monarch butterflies, and you see a butterfly, I'll hold this a little bit closer. Thankfully, this is see-through, so I can see what I'm showing you. <laughs> These black dots right here on the hind wings, that's a male. So pretty cool. We can't do that with all butterfly species, but we can do that with monarch butterflies. Awesome stuff, right? <laughs> all right, 
right, so we're going to go back to our PowerPoint uh, to learn some more stuff about why monarchs are so special. Because they're pretty incredible. Okay, there we go. All right, so one last thing I did want to mention is that despite all of those warning colors that the caterpillars have and that the adults have, it can still be a hard life out there for a larva. And there are many kind of dangers that could be present. So these are pictures from my garden as well. So one thing that can happen to monarchs is something called a tachnid fly, and that's that first picture. And when a caterpillar is growing and developing, this fly will, this is kind of gross, lay eggs inside the caterpillar's body. And once the caterpillar pupates, becomes that chrysalis, the, that fly larva will hatch out of the chrysalis. And it'll kind of slide down that goopy looking string that's hanging out of there. So gross, right? But part of life, flies have to live too. Um, wasps, despite their warning colors, can also predate caterpillars. Uh, so that's a picture of a wasp that I found snacking on some caterpillars. And then there are also different kinds of diseases and bacteria that can affect chrysalids too. But providing lots of healthy habitat with places for these animals to hide and hang out can help prevent some of this a little bit, which is a really, really good thing. It's always good to have a balanced ecosystem. All right, now what makes monarchs special? Well, monarch butterflies go through about a 3,000 mile migration every year. So they will overwinter in Mexico, in a very special region in the mountains in central Mexico. And then after the winter is over, they will start making their way north to southern Canada and then everywhere in between. Now here in St. Louis, we're in a really unique spot in that we're kind of at the middle of this migration. And I'm gonna see if this works. I tested it out on my end. We'll see if it works out live, but we can actually map and trace the migration. And this is from an organization called Journey North. All right, and what's really cool is that citizen scientists, so people just like you and me, are giving this organization, Journey North, this data to track the migration. And we'll talk about how we can do that too. So these are first sightings for our monarch butterflies. So these are people who are saying, ah, this is the first time I've seen a monarch butterfly this year. I'm gonna rush over to the website and type it in. And let's go ahead and play so we can see this migration. So here's our color key. So each month range, they've assigned a different color so we can see the migration. But if we hit play, take a look at Mexico right down here and then watch what happens. It'll go kind of fast. So you can see starting in April, the monarchs are making their way into the United States. And now it, towards the end of May, they've almost made it to their summer grounds in Southern Canada. So pretty cool. So this is really fun stuff and it's something you can do with your family. And how we can do that is, there we go. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot I put this picture in here. This is a little lady butterfly who uh, had made the journey to St. Louis, probably from Mexico. So we can see her wings are a little bit beat up. Her colors are very dull, but she's a trooper. She's toughing it out. She made it and she will probably lay some eggs or probably did lay some eggs while she was flying over St. Louis so that the next generation of monarch butterflies can continue that journey north. Cool stuff. All right, so Journey North, like I said, is part of a citizen science initiative. So this is citizen science. It's just people like you and me helping out scientists. Um, and if you go to their website, I put it at the bottom of the slide, journeynorth.org backslash monarchs, you can create a free account so that you too can log your sightings and help all of the different scientists out there who are researching monarchs and even more different kinds of animals and signs of seasons and springs track to see if things are changing and if they are, how they're changing. Now the important part, how do we help monarchs? Well, like I said, our Wild Care Center and the city of St. Louis put together this Milkweed for Monarchs initiative. 
because recognizing that even if you have a small space, you too can help monarch butterflies. So I'm gonna have Connor share another poll and I'm going to ask you, do you think you have space for milkweed? Because some people think they need, wow, I just need to uh, change my whole area <laughs> to make space for milkweed. And maybe you're getting a space ready or you'd like to have a space in the future. I know when I used to live in an apartment, I dreamed of the day I could buy a house with a yard and plant milkweed in it. So then I might have answered not yet. <laughs> Although I have heard too of some people growing some species of milkweed in pots. It could work. It's always fun to experiment. <laughs> All right, so it looks like a lot of you do have some good space to plant plants that are helpful to monarchs. Um, and those are plants like milkweed. So this list that I have pictured here um, are all plants that are beneficial to monarchs and other pollinators. So if you want to help monarchs, for sure have a species of milkweed planted because those caterpillars need something to eat. And the three species that are really common here in uh, the St. Louis area are common or prairie milkweed, swamp milkweed, and um, world milkweed. There are some other native species, but these seem to be the best for growing in our area. And if you live outside of St. Louis, uh, do your research and make sure you're planting milkweed native to your area. Um, but the other plants that are listed are also helpful because those are going to be nectar sources, food sources for the butterflies. And that's things like purple coneflower, New England aster, bee balm, goldenrod, butterfly weed, and black-eyed Susans. I mean, really, any native flowering plant is going to be beneficial to those monarch butterflies. And picking a variety of plants that so that you have blooms from spring to fall will also help because sometimes you might get those monarchs that are migrating all the way up from Mexico and they're maybe probably a little bit tired and hungry and need a drink. So having something that blooms in early spring and available for them is good. And then as they start their migration back down from Canada, having something in the fall for them to stop, rest and refuel. So something like that goldenrod and the aster will be really beneficial for them as well. And you don't need a ton of space to help monarch butterflies. These two pictures are gardens, spaces that friends of mine have set up for monarchs. You can see one is larger than the other. So just providing a little bit of a nectar source, a food source for those butterflies, you're going to do a world of good. Wow, that was a lot, right? <laughs> So much to go through, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, so this webinar will be recorded, so if I went over something that you want to go back to and review, take a look at it when it's posted up on our website. But I am going to take a moment to see if we have any questions. So if you've not found that Q&A box, go ahead and pop those questions in there for me. All right. Ah, good question. Is milkweed poisonous? So, um, it is, it has a toxin in its tissues, in its plant tissues. Um, humans, us, we don't eat milkweed. We don't need to eat milkweed. Um, I enjoy looking at milkweed. I think the flowers on milkweed are really, really beautiful. And my common milkweed, as I found out when it blooms, smells like lilacs. That was a really pleasant surprise. So, oh, good question. Are there different types of milkweed and does it matter for the monarch, monarch butterflies what kinds of milkweed is in your yard? So there are different kinds of milkweeds. There are lots of different species of milkweed and it really doesn't matter what kind is in your yard. Um, what may matter, well, I should say it doesn't matter for the butterfly. It may matter for your own personal aesthetics or if you live in a neighborhood uh, with like a homeowner's association, some milkweeds can get really, really tall. Um, my common milkweed some years has been about as tall as I am. I'm 5'5", five five, so maybe not the best front yard plant, depending on your local ordinances. Um, but there's, yeah, there's the common, there's swamp, there's world, uh, there's a purple milkweed, there's something called antelope horn milkweed. There's lots of different kinds of milkweed. It's a fun internet rabbit hole <laughs> to fall down. All right. Oh, another good question from Ryan. Are there other butterflies that look like monarchs? Yes, there are. 
Um, specifically, the viceroy butterfly looks a lot like the monarch butterfly. And the one way you can tell a difference is that a viceroy will have another black line that goes from about here to here. But other than that, it looks almost completely identical. And there are a lot of orange and black butterflies out there in the world because just like with our yellow and black caterpillars, orange and black is a signal to a lot of animals to stay away. I taste bad. <laughs> All right. Oh, there's so many good questions. Okay, I think I am going to pick maybe two more <laughs> and then we'll be done for the day. All right, our, what are the most common states to see a monarch butterfly? Ooh, really, really good question. Um, so I don't know if there is a specific state where you see more, um, but the monarchs tend to follow what's called a Mississippi flyway. So if you know where the Mississippi River is in the United States, starts in Minnesota, will make its way down south before it discharges in the Gulf of Mexico and Louisiana. Um, the monarchs kind of follow right along there. So almost to in between the Appalachian Mountains to St. Louis's east and the Rocky Mountains to our west. So there are a lot of states where you can see a monarch butterfly. And definitely if you have plants that monarchs like, you will see more. Okay, all right. And how about our last question? How many years for milkweed to bloom? Mm. This was something I learned from my own personal experience. I have mostly common milkweed in my yard. And the first year it came up, I had no flowers. So what gives? The second year it came up, I still had no flowers. The third year it came up, I finally had flowers. And I did some research and with common milkweed, that's common. It takes about three years since you planted the seed for those flowers to bloom. Now, my friends who have swamp or marsh milkweed, they get blooms every year and they get blooms right away. So it can be really fun to observe your own space too and what you have. So, okay, with that, we are out of time. Um, thank you, Connor, for popping up that poll for me. So we do want to know if you enjoyed today's program or not. I certainly enjoyed presenting it to you. Hope you learned some new things and are motivated to get out there and see what else you can do to help monarch butterflies. Uh, thank you all for joining me today. I hope you have a great west rest of your day. Stay happy, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.